Good evening and welcome to the Thursday, March 10th, 2016 meeting of the Northampton School Committee. I'm Mayor David Narkowitz and I will ask the clerk to call the roll of the school. Here. Present. 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 Here. Here. Present. Present. Thank you. Um, the first item on the agenda this evening is our public comment period. Um, we ask people to come to the podium and to state their name uh, so the clerk has it for the record. Um, I do have a three minute timer which I will uh, display for folks to uh, try to um, stay within that parameter so that everyone has a fair opportunity to speak. And we do have a list of people who have signed up this evening. Um, the first person is Michael Holroyd. Good evening. Uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak. My name is indeed Michael Holroyd and I live on Golden Drive in Florence. And I have now been a substitute teacher in the Northampton Public Schools for over nine years. I've taught at the high school, elementary school, uh, mostly at JFK, which I really enjoy. I've also taught at Smith Volk and just coincidentally I was on the strategic planning committee that was set up in 2008 and 9 to look at the whole issue of how we fund our schools, the structure of our schools and so on. So I'm here to tonight to speak about the pay scales for substitute teachers and substitute ESPs. Um, the reason I'm doing this publicly is that officially we substitutes do not have a union, we're not part of a union, we're not we don't have a formal seat at the table in any budget deliberations. So I thought it would be a good idea just to hear from a genuine substitute. Um, I started, as I said, in to early 2007, and quite honestly, I've looked through my old pay stubs. I cannot find any checks from that year, so I cannot tell you with all honesty what the pay scale was. But I do have a check here from January of 2008, and when I substituted as a teacher, I was paid $70 a day. And when I substituted for an ESP, I was paid $9.75 an hour. And now, we're over eight years later, there hasn't been a single change in that pay rate. I have slight change myself because after two years I became certified for middle school, so I get paid $75 a day. Recently, the Massachusetts minimum wage went up to $10 an hour. Next January, it's going to go up to $11 an hour. Now, I don't need to tell you, especially in the concept of a differentiated classroom, the importance of having good subs and good ESPAs, ESPs and having them when they're needed. And recently, um, it's just, it seems like we're having a hard time maybe at JFK of getting subs. And it's possible, it's just possible that one small element of that is the pay scale. And we all have the same ultimate goal, which is the education of our children and giving them the best head start that they can possibly do. Now I understand uh, that there's a draft or proposed budget out there and I'm very happy to see that there is a proposed increase in those pay rates. I believe um, $10.50 an hour in the next budget period for ESPs and an increase of $5 a day for teachers, certified teachers, and retired teachers, going up to, I think, 75, 80, and 85. So I really welcome that, and I thank you for doing that. And I urge you to adopt that, not cut it back in any deliberations that happen. And my final thoughts to you, as I'm at 2 minutes and 50 seconds, <laughs> is I hope at the back of your minds you don't think, aha, we've dealt with that. Let's go at least another eight years <laughs> before changing it again. <clears throat> Thank you for your time. As I said to the eighth graders today that were doing history, a good old British saying, be calm and carry on. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Michael. Next speaker is uh, Diana Asia. Ms. Asia. Hello. Um, I'm here to speak on um, the idea of a task force to look at challenge in the curriculum at JFK and the high school. My name is Diana Agen, and I am a resident of Florence, a parent of two children who attended Northampton Public Schools and a seventh grade English teacher at JFK. 
Being both a parent and a teacher in the district has always given me a unique perspective on all things education, curriculum, after school offerings, sports, budgets, community support, and contracts. First, I will speak as a parent. Both my husband and I, as well as our children, have experienced academic challenge, a wide selection of after school enrichment and sports opportunities, as well as positive student parent teacher relationships. Because of this, we presently have a daughter excelling at Syracuse University, as well as a son about to graduate from the plumbing program at Smith Vocational. As a family, we are grateful for the dedication, integrity, skill, and professional knowledge of Northampton faculty and administrators who have shepherded our children to become successful young adults. As a teacher, I am proud to be part of an intelligent and creative collegial community. We actively and continually engage in reflective practice, furthering our educational practice through both collective and individual professional development. We consider ourselves professionals in our field who don't necessarily have all the answers, but who always strive to find and create them. Education is a continually evolving process for the student, the teacher, as well as the field itself. And thus, we continually revise curriculum and practices to meet the diverse needs and interests of our population. JFK curriculum teacher leaders and department chairs are leading their departments and colleagues in this process, writing curriculum units onto Atlas Rubicon, utilizing the understanding by design model, and with a close eye on differentiation. This is a process that takes time to complete and implement. But as both a parent and a teacher, I've witnessed and taken part in these educational shifts over time, all of which have strengthened our educational process here in Northampton. Underlying all of this work, of course, is the objective to reach all learners. With regard to a task force to examine rigor in our schools, I say, who best to evaluate and act upon this but teachers and administrators, themselves, the professionals in the field? In fact, this is what we do all day, every day, from one class, one day, one week, one year to another. The formation of a task force seems unnecessary at best and insulting at worst. As both a parent and a teacher, I say, let's trust our faculty and administration to conscientiously and professionally perform their jobs well to educate the wonderful children in our community. Thank you. The next speaker is Jeremy Whalen. Hello, everyone. Jeremy Whalen. Uh, from Amherst, Massachusetts, uh, but I'm a technology teacher here, and I probably spend more time in Northampton than actually at my own house. Uh, I want to talk to you about a couple of things. First, uh, the robotics, uh, you're gonna see field trip requests on there. Uh, this weekend is our first, at WPI, is our first uh, competition. We're going in with probably the strongest robot, uh, both from mentors that, the, that have been there previously, uh, and uh, sponsors and parents. Uh, this is the strongest robot, and I think that the student uh, leaders have really put in a lot of effort to not only make the strongest robot, but also develop this team into a sustainable organization and a welcoming place, an inclusive place for all of our students, both from NHS and from Smith Vocational. Um, uh, aside from that, uh, we also, uh, I'm pleased to announce that we have won at, at NHS uh, 24 Scholastic Writing and Arts Awards, uh, of which uh, NHS Tech Department uh, received six of those. I believe it's the first time NHS Tech has submitted and won. We actually won uh, one gold key and two silver keys, which are the gold key is the highest award for uh, regionally. Um, and in addition to that, we also, uh, I put in, you'll see it onto the next, uh, we received a grant for $2,000 from uh, New Matter for three 3D printers from the Educate and Inspire grant from uh, New Matter, the company, which will, uh, will be on, the donation request has been put in. And the reason why I, I talk about all of this is because every single day, what we see is the challenging of our students. Um, and as, as a teacher, it can, uh, the best thing that I, the, th something that I really truly appreciate about this district is the open lines of communication. Uh, and I think that's a testament that uh, last uh, 
last Friday we sat in here uh, with Dr. Provost, uh, members of the school committee, and we really made an effort to, uh, before negotiations, get together and say, you know, communication is really important to us. And so uh, it was discouraging seeing that there was no reaching out uh, from, from my knowledge or the teachers that I spoke with at the high school to first see what we offer. Um, and first see where we are succeeding. Uh, I think that we do a tremendous job at both developing our curriculum. I think that the history of the Middle East uh, course, for instance, that you uh, proved in the last meeting, uh, I was a part of a uh, late night book club with Norm Cody and we actually read a 300 page tome on, on the history of the Middle East uh, just to round out the corners of that. Um, and there's a lot of stuff that goes on behind the scenes that you may not be uh, privy to. And what I would say is that I would really focus on open lines of communication and I think that we have a wonderful working relationship with the teachers, administration and the school committee here and I hate for that to be strained. Uh, without, uh, you know, due cause here. So, thank you. Thank you Next speaker, uh, Tracy Dawson Green. Hello, I'm Tracy Dawson Green. I'm a 25 year veteran teacher in the Northampton Public Schools. Currently, I teach seventh grade at JFK. I'm also the social studies department chair for grades six through eight and a curriculum teacher leader. Um, this is a, just a piece of an email that I sent um, about the task force that I wanted to share. And that is, I am confident that if the school committee were to take the time to assemble a task force, that the task force would find after many meetings how to determine a tool, tool to measure the rigor of our classes that the work within the teams, the departments at JFK, as well as the curricula, which is being horizontally and vertically aligned, is meeting the needs of all of our students. Tim Levy, our math department chairperson from JFK, asked me to share the following extension op options currently available. Um, so in our math classes, students have choices to work within some classes to select more challenging classwork and homework. Extensions are available that utilize technology, such as graphing calculators, Desmos, and or Khan Academy. And um, there are complex problems that require patient problem-solving strategies and complex thinking that are offered in place of skills-based homework or classwork. And he gave me a couple of examples to share with you. And if anyone needed copies, I can leave these. Um, some of the activities are open-ended and um, children work together to do problem solving and planning and varying degrees of scaffolding are offered depending on both the individuals and the group. So this example he gave me is called a can design contest. The objective of this contest is to make a cylindrical can with the lowest surface area for a given volume. And so they have to design three different kinds of cans that hold five to six fluid ounces, 10 to 11 fluid ounces, 15 to 16 fluid ounces um, with the least material possible. And then um, some, some uh, there's chart given and depending on what support is needed for certain students, some of that might be filled in or um, helped, otherwise the students might figure it out um, together. Finally, um, there's another example he gave me where he had sort of a, a basic uh, activity where children are writing and solving proportions, and this would be sort of the basic version, but then students could choose either at the beginning or um, after they finish the first one to um, do one which is much more challenging and complex, and, um, they, and would, they would need to dig deeper to figure that out. So the differentiation that we're providing at the middle school is, um, goes in every direction to meet the needs of all of our students. Thank you. The next speaker is Brian Lombardi. Good evening, Brian Lombardi, 24 Clark Ave, Northampton. I'm also the principal of Northampton High School. I'm not here to discuss how Northampton High School challenges or does not challenge our students. I am here though to tell you how we support our students. We support our students' abilities and interests through a rich elective program of arts, theater, music, and technology, 
and a wide variety of college preparatory courses, which include 14 specific advanced placement and 15 honors courses. Of the 275 students taking the 2015 AP exam, 81% had a qualifying score of three or higher. Our course offerings and professional and dedicated faculty provide for student success the results in approximately 89% attending post-secondary education. Northampton High School also offers a supportive and accepting school environment where students are safe to be who they are and are accepted and respected for their differences. Through heterogeneous course offerings, students of all abilities and backgrounds establish a positive and healthy learning environment which not only supports student success, but also good citizenry. The recent request of a, for a feedback, the recent request for feedback of a school committee task force questioning the course offerings at NHS is divisive in nature, demoralizing the teachers, and above all, missing the point of our school culture. Anyone can see with their AP and honors offerings that students have provided ample learning opportunities for rigor and challenge beyond our college preparatory offerings. Opportunities for students of different backgrounds, interests, and abilities to learn together, create and support a healthy and positive school culture. The teachers and administrators utilizing expertise and research have worked to establish a learning environment that supports all students and provides the necessary skills to be successful in contributing members of the community. I believe our continued exceptional performance as a top tier school is determined by MCAS scores, AP testing, dropout rates, and college placement, and our overall supportive and accepting school culture suffices to answer the question or concern of whether we challenge our students. Thank you. The next person signed up is uh, Rachel Hall. What's that? Stately Hale, I'm sorry. <laughs> Between my eyes and your writing, so I'm sorry. Well, sorry about that. Hi, I'm Rachel Stavely Hale, 52 Hat, uh, Hatfield Street in Northampton. Um, I have been a math teacher at Northampton High School for the past nine years and have been department chair for the last three. Uh, or I'm in my third year as department chair. Um, my daughter uh, graduated from Jackson Street School last year and is now a sixth grader here at JFK. Um, I'm here to read a letter tonight on behalf of the mathematics department at NHS. Um, we are writing to express our concern about the tone and the nature of the conversation around secondary mathematics curriculum in the Northampton Public Schools. Over seven years ago, a group of math teachers at JFK and NHS came together to take a closer look at the progression of topics and skills taught in our classes in order to better align them and in order to identify ways to increase enrollment and diversity in our advanced math courses at NHS. This vertical team was not created at the behest of administrators, but by the teachers themselves, who in analyzing enrollment and achievement data first identified this problem. When the first draft of the new 2011 math frameworks were released, the vertical team members, which at that time included and currently includes the mathematics department chairs, set ourselves the task of researching how we might best implement the standards and what implications that might have for our departments in terms of course offerings and resources. The decisions to unlevel the math courses at JFK and transition to an integrated math program at NHS were the culmination of this research and were made thoughtfully in collaboration with and with the support of teachers and administrators. We've held multiple informational events for parents and community members. We've appeared before the school committee multiple times to explain this resequencing of curriculum content. We've posted letters on our websites explaining the changes and how they might impact students. We regret that at times our communication was not as immediate or effective as we might have liked but we have responded to every request for information from community members honestly and as quickly as we were able. We are mathematics teachers. We make research-based, data-driven decisions. We would never make decisions, uh, take decisions as serious as this capriciously or without serious research and debate. And the idea that we want anything other than to challenge all of our students to achieve at the highest levels possible is absurd. The primary goal behind the unleveling of courses at JFK was to increase enrollment in advanced math courses at NHS. And so far, our data confirmed that this outcome is being achieved. We have invested significant time and effort into supporting each other through this transition, particularly with respect to differentiating instruction, and we will continue to do so. 
Through our implementation of the new integrated math courses, uh, though our implementation of the new integrated math courses at NHS is not without some bumps in the road, we continue to feel positively about these changes and we hear positive feedback from our students about their experiences in the new courses. And as any good math student knows, anecdotal data are of limited value. So in addition to asking our students opinions on their experiences in our classrooms in an ongoing way, we are continuing our established practice of analyzing MCAS, SAT, and AP test data. And we will be the first ones to want to correct any dips that we see indicated by those metrics. May I have permission to go a little bit longer? You may. Okay. Um, Since I mispronounced your name. <laughs> I appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we care deeply about our students' success, and to suggest anything to the contrary is insulting to our integrity and to our expertise. We are highly trained, highly motivated, experienced educators who consistently strive to challenge all of our students. When concerns arise about individual students, we work collaboratively with parents, guidance counselors, special education faculty, administrators to identify and to resolve the problem. We pour our hearts into our work. We lose sleep over the kids we're not reaching. We miss out on time with our families because we're planning lessons that we hope will challenge and inspire our students. Any conversation about whether those efforts are successful absolutely must include us. It's a privilege to teach in this district with such fine students and such skilled colleagues, and we would hope that the members of the school committee recognize the good work we do, and in the future, include us in their requests for feedback about the work happening in our buildings. We'd also hope that the members of the committee understand, as our students do, that in seeking information, one should always balance qualitative and quantitative data and seek data from a variety of sources to ensure as accurate a representation of the situation as possible. And finally, we hope that committee members understand the importance of respectful dialogue and appreciate their influence in the community in setting the tone of the conversation. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Holly Graham. <coughs> uh, good evening, my name is Holly Graham. Um, I am a resident of Northampton, 90 Pomeroy Terrace, and I am a seventh grade English teacher at JFK Middle School. And this is my 13th year teaching. Along with being a teacher at JFK, I serve in various roles and on many committees in the district, all of which are focused on differentiating <coughs> the curriculum for all students and the professional development necessary to support teachers within this model. In addition, I have taught courses in curriculum instruction at UMass Amherst and UMass Boston. In all of these capacities, I am constantly learning how to research, create, and then in turn instruct teachers on designing and differentiating curriculum for the benefit of all students. I'm coming to the school committee this evening as both a teacher and a resident of Northampton to raise my concern about the suggestion of a task force intended to evaluate the curriculum at JFK. In particular, one focused on the rigor available for students in our school. I have several concerns about the public explanations and the rationale for this as were cited during the last school committee meeting. When I arrived in Northampton in 2011, after teaching in other districts in the state for five years, I was shocked that classes were leveled. I had never heard of a middle school with leveled classes, despite teaching in both urban and suburban settings before arriving here. In neither of my previous positions with the district have even tolerated level classes or conversations at the middle school level. Therefore, I was delighted when we as a school decided to reverse this dated curriculum practice in the fall of 2013. Therefore, the task force idea recently introduced by a few members of the school committee is predated by several years of thoughtful discussion about leveling at the middle school during which we work tirelessly to consider the value of separating students into courses based on artificial and subjective categories that ultimately negatively tracked most students for an academic future before they even arrived at high school. Our decision to de-level was further informed by years of MCAS data in which teachers and administrators evaluated, which suggested that leveling did not actually yield better academic results but rather provided static data for both sets of groups, students who were in high and low level classes at JFK. As a professional, therefore, I am firmly suggesting that suggesting a task force in the name of rigor and high and low standards is not only short-sighted, it is disruptive to the work of the district, and it is not reflective into what entails student learning. The idea that student learning can be labeled high and low is ludicrous, and it is simply not true. After years of teaching in middle school, I can assure the members of the school committee that when trying to determine grouping, all that goes into student learning rarely lines up neatly. 
maturity, executive functioning, reading, writing, health, student interests, first language. When taken together, these are difficult aspects of a child's learning to try to correlate and then in turn make long-term choices about their education. In addition to the artification of learning boundaries used to determine levels, there is the art of teaching itself. I am honestly a better and more rigorous teacher when I am in a room of varied learners. May I have permission to finish? Yes. Rather than when I separate out students based on what becomes levels based on, frankly, socioeconomic status. I realize this is in conflict with the major belief systems about teaching and learning, but I'm simply more conscientious about student learning when I have varied levels around me. It promotes my own practice of when to challenge, when to push, when to pull back, and when to reconsider the moment-by-moment -moment learning that happens in an integrated classroom. If a teacher separates out students, however, the mindset of the teacher adjusts and shifts. By this I mean I will assume certain behaviors of certain groups if I work with them separately, and therefore will have a narrower mindset about student learning. Differentiating teaching, therefore, simply yields rigor, as the teacher must think more broadly about what constitutes student learning. Working in this public school system means a lot to me as a professional and a citizen. I am passionate about designing the most inclusive and least restrictive education for all students in this district, given the amount of money and time and effort invested in what student learning means and how teachers can best help achieve that over the last few years, I strongly urge the school committee to continue to support the democratic, intellectual, intellectual critical, and efficacy-driven work of the teachers at JFK and dismiss the notion of a task force. Thank you. That was the uh, complete list of folks who had signed up. Is there anyone else who wishes to speak during the public comment? Okay, hearing none, we'll move on to the next um, uh, piece on the agenda. That's the recommended actions. Um, actually, check that. We have announcements. I'm sorry. Are there any announcements? You can post. Well, I do. I have a couple of announcements. First of all, um, I want to just remind the public that um, at the high school this evening, uh, they've kicked off their spring production of the musical You're in Town. Um, it's running tonight, uh, tomorrow night, and there's two shows on Saturday. It will be $12 for adults, seniors, I believe students, and teachers are $8, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I guess I also like to say that, um, give a shout out to little Becky Two Shoes, who's my daughter, Grace, who's uh, in the show tonight. Um, I guess as they say in the biz, break a leg, honey. I'll see you Saturday night at the show. I'm busy this evening. Okay. Also, um, I just want to say thank you to the parents and to the teachers for sharing their thoughts and concerns this evening with the school committee. I want to clarify, the school committee at this time is not seeking community input on challenge in the Northampton Public Schools, not from the community, not from teachers. I could ask the superintendent or the clerk uh, through, meeting, through meeting minutes or checking agendas, uh, should someone think any different than that. Um, furthermore, I would say if this committee does wish to pursue this topic of challenge in the Northampton Public Schools, then it should be discussed first here as a full board and with the majority vote be pursued at that time. I believe it would be unwise, not to mention unfair, to do this without first asking our superintendent to comment on this matter and to leave individual teachers and in particular schools out of any conversation. Um, I guess as I didn't realize Dr. Graham was going to be here, so I hope I get all this right. But I suppose as a sort of testament to the success she's had with the unleveled classrooms, um, on Saturday, a group of students from JFK will be traveling with their advisor, Dr. Graham, to the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston to be recognized for their achievements in the Scholastic Writing Competition. Um, Dr. Provost, Dr. Cheevers, Principal Wilson, members of the NEF and I were fortunate enough to attend a reading of their award-winning works this week. And I cannot tell you how blown away I was by the talent of this group, the maturity, 
um, and their obvious devotion to their teacher. Um, this year, 19 students submitted works to the regional competition. Of these 19 submissions, 13 students received recognition. Uh, what makes this so remarkable is that these, these works that they submit are bledged, uh, judged blindly. Um, all identifying information is remo removed, name, age, gender, public school or private school. Um, so our eighth graders won these awards that they're typically awarded, I understand, to the top 5% of students um, against 12th graders. So our students um, are doing remarkable things. Um, I'd like to congratulate the students, Dr. Graham, and of course thank the Northampton Education Foundation for funding the project. Any other, any other announcements? Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh. Can I, I'd like to just announce that I really appreciate what um, Mr. Zahowski said because I'm appalled that, that um, teachers felt and principals feel undermined because boy do, are you doing a great job and um, and if you if we did have a debate you would have heard from mm -hmm. I, I, I would say the majority of us I would hope how wonderful you are and that a task force is undermining and divisive and that the work that this superintendent has been doing finally we have a leader um, for a while um, the the negative toxicity of that call appalls me and I think you would have heard that from us so that's my announcement thank you okay. any other announcements okay Miss Fallon <laughs> more of an acknowledgement okay. um, last evening was the um, band concert at JFK and it's always so impressive and I honestly um, Claire Ann Williams is more of a magician than a teacher, I think, because I know some of these students have never picked up an instrument, and yet she's able to put on this amazing program uh, and pull it all together, and it's phenomenal. But what I'd like to acknowledge is um, what, what actually moved me the most was seeing at least one fifth grade teacher there supporting his students who had moved on um, to JFK and how thrilled they were to have him there um, and to say that we know we don't formally recognize that they don't win awards but I see it all over town the teachers who go to performances at the Academy of Music to see students who are performing in a ballet who go to sporting events who go to plays the dedication and support the teachers in this district show to our students doesn't end at the end of the school day or the school year it continues throughout their time in the system and beyond um, and I just want to say it doesn't go unnoticed and it certainly doesn't go unappreciated by parents and students. So I want to thank them. Okay. Any other announcements? Okay, uh, next we have the recommended actions and we have a consent agenda this evening. Uh, it consists of the approval of minutes of the school committee meeting of February 11th, 2016, the budget and property subcommittee meeting of February 18th, 2016, the school committee meeting of February 25th, 2016. We also have field trip requests, the NHS robotics uh, first robotics competition <coughs> at WPI in Worcester, uh, March 11th through the 13th, 2016. And then the NHS robotics uh, first robotics competition, Providence Career and Technology Academy in Rhode Island, March 24th through the 26th, 2016. The NHS Model UN, Model UN Conference and UN in New York City, May 12th through the 15th, 2016. And the Bridge Street Second Grade, going to the Connecticut Science Center in Hartford, Connecticut, May 25th, 2016. Um, I would please ask for a motion to approve the consent agenda. Motion to approve the consent agenda. Second. There's been a motion made and seconded. Um, all those in favor of approving the consent agenda, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, so the items on the consent agenda are approved. Um, we'll now move to our student representative, and I'll turn it over to you, Zach Dietz. Thank you. Um, first, uh, I'd just like to thank Ed for mentioning the musical. Um, I know a lot of students have been putting a lot, a lot of work into that, um, and so people can see that tonight it's too late, but tomorrow night, and then there's two shows on Saturday. Um, Last Friday, uh, Dr. Lynn Phillips from UMass came um, to NHS and she spoke to uh, seniors and juniors. Um, and then also at 7 p.m. at night, she came in um, 
and gave a presentation and she was showing her film flirting with danger um, and then which was followed by a Q&A session um, and that film uh, is a presentation focused on consent and sexual harassment um, and the media's role in pressuring teens to act certain ways um, so it's really great that we're getting high school students thinking about this topic. Um, I know it was very well received by all the teachers who saw it. They were very happy that um, high schoolers were, were seeing this. And um, there was mixed uh, feedback from high schoolers. Obviously, it's not going to please everyone. But um, I think generally, it was very well received um, by the high school community. And it's definitely um, furthering a dialogue that has been going on in the high school com uh, community. Um, and Mr. Lombardi has said that he hopes uh, topics like this will be explored in the new wellness curriculum that is being developed that he presented on um, a couple months ago, uh, that uh, things like, like Dr. Lynn Phillips' visits could be explored in future years for future classes when um, there are like wellness days for the, the upperclassmen. Um, so that event was uh, co-sponsored by Caught Off Guard Key Club and the Northampton Prevention Coalition. Another event the Northampton Prevention Coalition is sponsoring is on March 24th, um, and Dr. Ruth Poti is um, coming to NHS, and she's giving a presentation titled The Teen Brain and Risk Taking. Um, that's gonna be in the NHS auditorium from 6.30 to 8.15 p.m., um, and there's gonna be free Joe's Pizza um, at the beginning, it's first come, first serve, so. Uh, hopefully that'll get some people out there. Um, yesterday we were fortunate enough to have a district-wide delay. Um, I believe that was um, a, prof a teacher um, professional training. Um, uh, so students definitely enjoyed that. It did cause some uh, um, mayhem, if you will, with kids who have Smith classes. Um, so I don't know if the schedule is set for next year but uh, this committee might want to consider, since it was a district-wide delay, putting that delay during the same week that Smith Vacation is, because Smith Vacation is actually just next week. So if they were overlapping with each other, there would be no um, missing of high school classes or missing of Smith classes. Uh, the Student, Students of Color Association at NHS uh, is doing a penny drive this week. So it, it pits the four classes against each other in a very communal way, it puts them against each other. And um, you, there's like four jars in front of the school, um, and any penny you put into your, your class's jar is a point for you. Any silver coin you put, put in another class's jar is a point against them. And then all the money raised um, is uh, going to Flint, Michigan. Um, so that's something that SOCA is doing. Um, the Key Club uh, is hosting a movie night uh, not this Friday, but next Friday, um, on March 18th at 7 p.m. in the high school auditorium. Um, and the movie we are showing is Shrek. Uh, we're hoping it can be kind of like a district-wide event. Um, so we, uh, there are a lot of high schoolers going, but um, we've, sent, uh, we've sent information out to all the other principals. Um, admission is $3, um, and there's gonna be sp pop some popcorn sold. Um, and yeah, we're hoping that will be successful. Um, moving on to sports, uh, the girls ba varsity basketball team went to the first round of playoffs, so that was very exciting. Uh, and for the indoor track team, uh, Jeremy Dole, Nick Smith, Marcus Peterson, and Liam Sullivan are competing at the high school national tournament uh, this weekend, it's in New York, and they are on a relay team, and then uh, the following day, Liam Sullivan is competing in the mile for NHS, so that is very exciting. Uh, the spring sports season will start on March 21st, um, and there is a mandatory parent meeting at NHS on March 28th at 6 p.m., so that's uh, really important to show up to. Uh, registration is open now for all um, sports, so you can go to the NHS Athletics webpage to sign up. Uh, and then it's also important if you're a freshman or a uh, junior to get, uh, we have concussion testing. Um, so you need to do that online at NHS. They have concussion testing days after school. Uh, another thing for sports, the Northampton Athletic Booster, Boosters Club is hosting their comedy night on Friday, April 1st at the Log Cabin at 8 p.m. 
Um, so that's a great way to support, support Northampton Athletics. Um, and that concludes uh, my, my updates. Unfortunately, I need to head out after this. I would love to stay, but, uh, <laughs> uh, but yeah, so <laughs> that's it for now. <laughs> that's it for now. Thank you, Zach. We'll, uh, we'll carry on without you. <laughs> um, okay, so we now move into a uh, presentation, and this is, of course, uh, one in an ongoing um, series of, uh, of presentations that we're having from our various schools without the, throughout the district. Um, tonight is uh, Principal Leslie Wilson um, from JFK Middle School. Okay, I'm just going to speak for a couple minutes before we go ahead and show our video. Um, first of all, I want to thank all the teachers who work here this evening um, and administrators in support of our students and the good work that's happening in our classrooms and in our schools. Um, truly a lot of what I wanted to say in public session or here, um, they said, and, and it was really well said. So thank you so much for being here and all of your good work. Um, so, tonight is JFK Teacher Recognition, and I am so excited to have this opportunity to recognize the exceptional teachers at JFK Middle School and to share just a small bit of their good work. We don't have enough time, clearly, to touch on everything that I would like to. Um, it's a privilege to work with educators who are truly committed to middle-level education, who love working with middle school students, and who are so outstanding <coughs> at it. The strength of our school truly is our faculty and staff. Our teachers challenge students academically and support their social and emotional growth during this time of great change. JFK teachers live the middle school model, creating smaller communities to contribute to the larger, providing rigorous, differentiated learning opportunities for all students, and making connections with students in our advisory program. Students at this age want to take on more responsibility, and they are guided in doing so, and in self-advocacy. Teachers support our students' commitment to fairness, equity, and in their many, many ideas, facilitating student initiatives, community service learning, and piloting restorative practices. JFK teachers devote themselves endlessly to our students in so many ways. Academic programs and field trips, creative learning activities, and interdisciplinary units of study. On any given day, a high percentage of our students are in the building after school meeting with teachers for extra help and enrichment or participating in programs and clubs led by faculty and staff. These opportunities include yearbook, theater club, the Gay Straight Alliance, newspaper, algebra for fun and profit, <laughs> jazz band, acapella, cooking, open gym, and many, many more. This year we had 11 winners in the Globe All Scholastic Writing Contest and a state level competitor in the Geography Bee. And I have to say he's not done yet. Um, and the Homer Club is starting soon. We also have more than 75 students participate in our before school fitness program daily. All of these activities and programs are only possible because of our teachers at JFK. The strength of our faculty is also in their culture of collaboration and professional learning. We have nine curriculum teacher leaders at JFK who facilitate curriculum development. Teachers are currently writing at, uh, units in Atlas Rubicon that include differentiated lessons and tiered vocabulary. Grade six teachers are developing and implementing a new language arts and reading curriculum. In the past month, 10 JFK teachers provided professional development for their colleagues. The work of our data team, instructional leadership team, and vertical math team is essential in supporting teaching and learning. Teachers meet every other day by team to support students and regularly by department to share lessons, assessments, reflect on practice, and analyze data. Lessons and resources are shared routinely on Google Drive. JFK, JFK teachers find great value in the expertise of their colleagues. So there's so much to speak about that I really could go on for most of your meeting. Um, but now I'm gonna stop and share um, a celebration of the teachers at JFK.
this is more specific number for way, way negative. All right, negative 300. So you guys, so remember your negative is down here. So let's try negative 300. Let's see what happens. Oh, so what do you think? It's definitely in the window. You probably didn't need to put to negative 300, but you can still use the intersection method. You want to try it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Set your equations, and then it gives you in real life time what the equation looks like graphing, just to reinforce your understanding of the material. And 
builds slowly until finally we get into the challenge slide. to thank Molly McLaughlin. She and I spent a lot of time shooting a lot of um, footage and it was so much fun I have to say and um, so I, she's our tech integration specialist and then she put this all together um, and so she's fabulous and her picture was in there too. Um, so in closing our students and community could not be more fortunate to have such a skilled, caring, passionate, committed and expert faculty. It's an honor to recognize them here tonight. And I love seeing them. <laughs> so thank you. I don't know whether you have any questions or comments or anything, but thanks for this opportunity. Thank you very much. OK, okay. so thank you very much again for that um, presentation. Um, we have a series of gifts that we need to vote on this evening. Um, I'll, uh, we'll go through them um, in order on the agenda and uh, the first one is a vote to accept a gift from the Jackson Street PTO um, up to $30,000 uh, and it's for use for the playground. Ms. Walzak? Yes. Um, just to remind everybody this is actually the second donation of up to $30,000 that the Jackson Street PTO has made. Um, several months ago they made the initial commitment of $30,000 and about 20,000 of that has been spent already on the playground project and there's 10,000 to go towards the bid award that you'll be making later tonight hopefully and then this 30,000 will also supplement that bid award and there'll be money left for some pieces that are yet to come Miss Agnes here and she may have something else to add about the project I have the check <laughs> <laughs> and um, just that it's really um, very thrilling for us to be able to be here tonight too ask you to accept this from our wonderful PTO that's very not only committed to the academic in our school but also in their recreational and in their whole body experience so we really are just so excited that we're going to be able to finish our playground project and we invite you all to come and play on it <laughs> thank you very much make a motion to accept the gift Jackson Street PTO up to 30,000 for pray for the playground Several seconds. <laughs> Any discussion about this uh, great project and wonderful gift? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, the gift is uh, gratefully accepted. The next item is a gift from the Northampton <coughs> Athletic Boosters. It's $8,750 to the Athletics Department. Ms. Walzik? Yes, this donation from the Athletic Booster Club is to fund um, gear and equipment for our spring teams to do some repairs to the mower that's used on the fields in the spring and also to purchase a storage shed for the field so that we can have a little more security for some of our equipment and have it more easily accessible to everybody. Okay. Any questions about that? Motion to accept the gift from Northampton Athletic Boosters in the amount of $8,750 to athletics. Second. Second. Okay. Um, any other discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, that gift is accepted. The next is a gift from the Boys Lacrosse Boosters, $3,000 for equipment and uniforms. Right, this will come in from our lacrosse boosters to provide some safety equipment and the replacement of some of the uniforms for the team. Okay. Move to accept the gift, boys lacrosse boosters, an amount of $3,000 for equipment and uniforms. Second. Second. Um, any discussion on this gift? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, that gift is accepted. Uh, next is a gift from the local vocal <coughs> cord bowl. It's 
it's an estimated $2,000 uh, gift and it's to the music programs. Yes, the Green Street Brew would like to once again this year donate 50% of the proceeds from the local vocal cord ball to us. Um, the event will be held this year at Amherst High School and half the proceeds will go to Amherst and half will go to Northampton if you agree tonight to be used for our music program. They did this last year and although the estimate was around 2000 we received over $3,000 last year that was divided up between the schools which is what we would do this year and it did everything from providing music stands for the high school to providing music supplies for the classrooms at the other level. So it actually, that $3,000 last year stretched against all the buildings and did quite a bit of good and we're hopeful the same thing will happen this year. And the event's April 2nd for anyone who's interested in going. We will get you the flyer if you approve this tonight. I move to accept the gift from local vocal cord bowl estimated $2,000 to music programs. Second. Second? This is there everywhere. Okay, second. <laughs> um, uh, any discussion on this gift? I just want to acknowledge that it, assuming we approve this, <coughs> we'll be uh, accepting over 43, almost $44,000. <laughs> I just want to thank the community. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Baird, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Ward okay. 6. Okay. Uh, continuing a great tradition from Ward 6. Um, all those in favor, <coughs> say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, that's, that one is approved. Um, we next have uh, uh, two, two votes um, uh, related to a retraction of a retirement. Um, and as you know, um, there is a policy with regard to retracting a, a retirement notice, and it uh, does require a school committee vote. Um, and so the first is a vote to retract the retirement of Elba Cologne. Do you want me to do these together? And, and we can do them together. Okay. And then the next one is uh, Barbara Rakoska. And I would ask uh, the superintendent to speak to those. My uh, philosophy with these types of situations is that when it's possible to exercise flexibility with an employee who is retired and then had a change of life ch circumstance, I think it is humane to do that. Um, one of the sad parts of my job is that I see often people retire and just when they're at that point in life when their time will be there, something happens. Um, and so it's not always possible to retract retirements because sometimes budget projections are based with the assumption of retirements built in. The proposed budget that I discussed at the last meeting um, is not dependent on either of these retirements. So my recommendation would be that you approve the retraction for both employees. Okay. Make a motion to approve the retirement retraction of both Elba Cologne and Barbara Rakoska. Second. Second. Any discussion on this? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, those are both approved. Next, we have a vote uh, on the 2016 2017 district calendar, and I'll turn it over to Dr. Provost. <laughs> In your packets, um, you'll, have a, you'll find a calendar for the 2016-2017 school year. Um, this calendar has been reviewed by the association leadership and declared free of contractual violations. It also has been reviewed by the district leadership to ensure that it meets the requirements for the required number of days and um, all time and learning requirements. Uh, I would just point out that Due to the changes in the statewide assessment system, you'll note that um, <coughs> there is a little bit of um, uncertainty around MCAS testing dates at this time, so those will have to be um, <coughs> straightened out as information comes in. Um, I would also point out that based on Zach Dietz's comment, I asked him about um, when the Smith College uh, spring break is next year. It is actually the next week, the week of the 13th through the 17th. We do have a two hour delay scheduled in this calendar for the 8th. Um, it would seem like it might be um, a sensible change to move that to the next week, but I'd um, prefer to review that with my team to make sure there are not other dates and also mm -hmm. wait for the MCAS calendar to be scheduled to make sure that we're not putting a late delay in a date that the state may name as an MCAS testing day. So, um, do you want to make a motion to? I make a motion to uh, 
approve the 2016-2017 district calendar. Are there any questions? Well, I'll second that. Okay. Uh, yeah. Sure. So I, I um, think it's really important for the calendar to be set because people make a lot of plans based on it, but I think the, um, the late start <laughs> could be moved within that because I don't think anybody is going to build their family vacation around mm -hmm. that. Yeah. So, um, so, uh, so I would think that would be the sort of thing that if we approve this, we could still change um, later as opposed to a bigger change like as in the first day of school in the fall or <laughs> something like that. Superintendent, am I correct in saying that um, the school committee approves the calendar start date for school in the last day and then there's flexibility within it? That's correct. As long as there's 180? Yeah. That's right. <laughs> so we, we vote the start date and the end date. Okay. So there's been a motion made and seconded. Any other <coughs> questions or discussion about Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Uh, the next item on the agenda is actually a presentation by uh, one of our colleagues, Mr. Moore, and it is an update from him on Northampton's uh, participation in the Collaborative for Educational Services. Uh, Mr. Moore is uh, this body's representative to CES. And yes. I will uh, turn the floor over to you. Thank you. So as of January, I became the uh, representative on the CES board. And um, so I, I'm starting to really learn more about how that CES works. It's the Collaborative for Educational Services. It used to have another name. Um, <laughs> but um, the Hampshire County. You know, Heck, the, yeah. um, but, but it's now the Collaborative for Educational Services, which reflects a lot of, actually, the name does reflect a lot. And I think. Um, I hope to sort of be learning together with all of us about CES in terms of what, both what it can offer, what it does offer, and um, and what that the collaborative part means. You know, because it clearly provides a lot of educational services. There are a lot of sort of a la carte things that we participate in. If in the materials that we sent you, is some basically the various department heads sort of pulled out sort of the things they could think of that we were buying and. And a lot of them are sort of like, essentially like buying club sorts of things, um, or we need, uh, you know, essentially a uh, consultant for a, for a single project, but it's not something we want to hire. It's not a position really. So a lot of those sorts of things. Um, but there also seems to be sort of um, some uh, relationship where if the if various districts sort of have a need, they can ask the collaborative if it's something that collaborative could develop a program to meet. So not something that's already on their list of, you know, things they do. And um, I've heard some examples of that already at the meetings I've been at of the collaborative where, because some of these districts are really small. Some of the districts are one elementary school um, and really have no, <laughs> no support staff whatsoever. And so they have, they, come across a need and then they go to the collaborative and say, can you guys put together something for this? And because they they're essentially are an administrative heavy kind of outfit compared to most of these districts, um, because that's what they do. They provide those kinds of support things. Um, so it's the kind of thing where I don't know, as a district, I think we can probably take more advantage of it. Um, but we want to pay attention because it's, it's like all these things where you subcontract it out, then it's not your program anymore. <laughs> and so the kinds of criticisms you might want to make of their programs, I think that's the part I have to sort of figure out is how that works, how, you know, how tight the feedback loop is on it so that when we hire them for a service, if we think about the service and say, well, it's not exactly what we wanted, but there's no place else to get it, <laughs> you know, in other words, we aren't going to do it in-house, how much we'll be able to talk to them about changing it to be more like what we would do if it were in-house. That's that sort of thing. I don't really know how it all works, and I'll hopefully be learning, but like I said, hopefully we're learning together. So the summary is it's 36 member districts, again, all sorts of different sizes. I think we might be the biggest of the districts. I'm not sure. Um, charter schools are eligible to be members, but none of them are. Um, the dues are based on after the, after the CES, puts together its budget, it then divides it up by the number of students in the member schools 
and that is an assessment that is the dues. Um, this past year it appears to have been $3.50 per student, so Northampton paid a little less than $10,000 in dues. Um, the core services that the, the collaborators were started for was to provide programming for um, low incidence populations in special education. So in other words, things that you couldn't, that districts couldn't have a, you know, any kind of a district-wide program or classroom program in special ed. So that, that's really a place where they started and they still have a number of those, you know, these schools with 12 students in them, you know, the Mount Tom Academy you've heard of, the Heck Academy. Um, and um, then also sort of training for teachers, parents, and community members around education, which I think is one of those things when you see it in the list of available stuff, we don't, I don't think we really use. We do a lot of actually teacher training and parent outreach, especially in our um, early childhood. Um, and uh, also through SPIFI, which, well actually it's not SPIFI, through our prevention coalition, which does connect with their prevention coalition stuff. So, so there's a lot of overlap between what we do and what they do, and that's the part of the collaboration part where I don't really know how fully we've explored that, and I've sort of hoped we do that, and keep everybody's eyes and ears open for that and to see, because I just don't really know. It's a big, sprawling thing, the Collaborative for Educational Services. It's essentially the 36 districts over Franklin and Hampshire County, ranging from every sort of school, from small, you know, small elementary school districts to um, vocational technical high schools. Um, it's really a lot of interesting folks. Um, I haven't figured out, I know I'm supposed to be loyal to the, as a board member of CES, I'm loyal to them, and as a board member here, I'm loyal to us. <laughs> and um, there are potential conflicts if CES is providing, you know, essentially going in competition with us, or vice versa. <laughs> um, and that's where I think it's about figuring out where, where it's collaboration versus competition. and. That'll be another one of those things that if anybody notices, you can feel free to let me know <laughs> that, that to be paying attention to that kind of stuff. Um, the, they have you know, plenty of outreach stuff online, so if you wanted to find out more about them besides the materials I gave you, there's uh, a blog.collaborative.org, um, and which has sort of the, the stuff they put out on themselves. Um, so far, it looks, it looks like a, um, a pretty open and welcoming group. I think one of the pieces that they've worked on recently that was you might be surprised by was the starting to collect information relative to the charter school funding formulas and really looking at the impact on the members of that. I mentioned that they, there are no charter schools who are members, but there are, uh, charter schools do use the services um, on an a la carte basis. As of paying the non-member prices. Are you taking questions? Yeah. <laughs> no, I was just really excited to see on there that the John Trafaglia was considering consolidating purchasing power for the cafeterias. Is, do you know much about that, what that would mean? No, I don't. Oh, okay. <laughs> then I probably shouldn't have asked you. <laughs> no, it's good. I, I, think, I think that would be a classic example of what I was talking about, about how they clearly will have some buying power in terms of bargaining and lower prices. but. You know, the kind of question is always then are we buying what we would want to buy? You know, because they're then being the purchasing agent and they're making choices about what they're buying. And so, so there's always going to be that kind of tension in terms of price versus stuff. I can give you a little background on that. John, the, the purchasing co op at CES has been around for probably yeah. more than 10 years. They do a number of different co op things, as does the um, Lower Pioneer Valley Collaborative, and we participate at various times. John has actually spent the past year or half a year he's been here comparing. We've done bids on our own in the past, and we've also purchased off of state contracts, which tend to be centered more in the eastern part of the state. So he spent this year comparing the prices at the collaborative to the prices we are paying through those two routes, and he was pretty adamant that the collaborative was getting better pricing for this area and is excited about joining in on those regional bids next year. Okay. Yeah, and like I said, then that then raised the next question of is, is it what we want to buy? Because clearly I, th I think the prices are, so it's a, you know, that's always going to be the kind of question that we're being asked. Mr. Provost? If I could just offer a point of information. Um, there is a steering committee for the Collaborative for Educational Services. I sit on the steering committee, and it one of the things we're constantly 
evaluating is whether the services match up with the needs of the district. Um, so I guess I would offer myself also as someone who you could offer feedback to um, to get to the CES top brass. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I, and I think the, the people who could offer that feedback would be everybody who's had some contact with one of their services, which is essentially every administrator, every teacher, and every family in our district is potentially has some sort of contact with one of these services because it's pretty, it's pretty sort of widespread throughout what we do. Any other questions for Mr. Moore? I'm not sure to whom, though. It says we have a number of students placed in tuition programs operated by CES. Do you know the number-ish? It's not real big because I don't think we had any at the, um, at the Educational yeah. Collaborative down on, on uh, Pleasant Street. And um, I don't think we had any on time, so I don't know that it's big this year. Fewer than 10, though. Yes, oh. I, I would say four or five. Okay, that's what I was wondering. Great. Thank you. Any other uh, questions or comments on Mr. Moore's presentation? Thank you very much, Howard, yeah. for uh, reporting to us. And like I said, it's not so much a report, it's more like a, you know, let's, uh, let's all collaborate on this collaborative thing. <laughs> okay. Well, we appreciate your collaborative approach. <laughs> uh, okay, so the next item on the agenda is a vote. Uh, this is actually um, uh, switching from our uh, CES uh, uh, representative to our legislative liaison. This is something that uh, Rebecca uh, Busansky has brought forward. This is a resolution to affirm the MASC resolution on full foundation budget uh, funding. And I'll turn it over to you, Ms. Busansky. Thanks. So I think we have all been discussing, and we all know the budget shortfall that we face here in Northampton, and that you know schools and cities and towns across Massachusetts face. And so when um, it was brought to my attention that MASC put forth this resolution calling for the full funding of the Foundation Budget Review Commission's recommendations, um, it felt important that we be on that list of cities and towns. And right now, I think the list is about 35 or 36 towns and cities across Massachusetts and more voting on it even this week. So um, I'd like to just read for the public, because I assume the committee has all read the resolution that MASC has put forth, including the rationale. And it's kind of lengthy, but I think it explains um, what their work has been about and what the recommendation is. So whereas the Massachusetts Foundation Budget Review Commission identified two areas, employee health insurance and special education, where the Massachusetts Foundation budget significantly understates their true cost of educating students in the Commonwealth and has failed to keep pace with rising costs, whereas this underfunding means the cost of providing a quality education has increasingly been borne by local communities, most often at the expense of other vital municipal operations, whereas investing in education today leads to higher incomes and thus less investment in police, prisons, subsidized health care, low-income housing, welfare, et cetera, in the future, whereas state and local economies are most effectively strengthened by investing in education and increasing the number of well-educated workers. Therefore, be it resolved that the Northampton School Committee calls on the Massachusetts Legislature and the Governor of Massachusetts to fully fund and adopt the recommendations of the Foundation Budget Review Commission in the immediate future. And here's the rationale. The Foundation Budget Review Commission was established by the legislature in the fiscal year 16 budget and was charged with examining the Foundation Budget Chapter 70 formula. The formula was first established as part of the education reform legislation in 1993 and has not been thoroughly reviewed or updated since that time. The FBRC insurance and special, oh, sorry, the FBRC found that the current formula understates costs significantly in two areas employee health insurance and special education. If the re recommendations of the FBRC had been implemented in the fiscal year 16 budget, state funding for education would have been about 500 million more than it was. However, if chapter 70 reflected the true cost of education, the number would be closer to 2 billion. Spending by school districts over the required net school spending amounts has increased as a whole for more than a decade indicating that communities are using local property taxes and diverting funding from other portions of municipal budgets to fund their schools. 
In fiscal year 14, the total spending above foundation in the state was $1.7 billion. At the same time, the state's commitment to municipal aid has declined. Since 2001, unrestricted local aid has been cut by 43 percent. The net effect is a combination of cuts to local and school services and increasing, an increasing reliance on the regressive property tax. The evidence overwhelmingly establishes the correlation between a well-educated workforce and higher income individuals. States that invest more in education have a higher paid workforce. Also, states that increase the level of education of their population see greater productivity and higher wages over time. The link can then easily be made between higher paid individuals and less reliance on various forms of government assistance, as well as lower rates of crime. A state's high school and college attainment rates are important factors in the state's overall economic strength. Additionally, investments in education can have significant long-term impacts on state and local economies. As well-educated individuals tend to stay relatively local and contribute tax dollars to the state and municipality in which they reside. In general, the taxes paid over time by these individuals are substantially higher than the cost of their public education. So uh, with that, I make a motion to vote in favor of the resolution calling for full funding of the Foundation Budget Review Commission's recommendations. Second. Okay. There's a second. Um, discussion on the uh, resolution? Okay. Um, I know we had <coughs> those uh, hearings was right here in North Camp. Yep. Uh, several, uh, many, several of us testified, and I know Dr. Provost uh, and I testified, so um, it was yeah. And I, I mean, I'd like to add, it was very moving that day at the commission. All, I mean, everyone who came forth from all these cities and towns and really spoke from their heart about what is they've gone through it being, you know, their public schools being underfunded. So I think it's important that we all join together. And I do believe, at some level, that um, at the state level, the squeaky wheel gets oiled, and that we need to really. Um, I'll just piggyback over on what Ms. Fallon said at the last meeting, but that I think it's really important that we together as a school committee make a push to get the funding that we need to make this uh, even better public school system. Uh, if, if I might add, the MASC resolution indicates that the true amount is probably closer to $2 billion, which is the right. same amount that the superintendents came up with. Um, there is a, a simulator out there right now that allows you to, to estimate what you would receive in Chapter 70 if this Commission's report was fully funded. And the increase for <coughs> Northampton would be about $290,000, which would bring us back to the 2002 levels of support that the state had. Um, so think about, think about where we all were in terms <coughs> of 2002. We're asking for this just to get back to that level. Um, it's also um, been sh shared with me in, in discussions with our local legislatures, the Slaters, that the only way really this, this commission's um, recommendations would even be considered is with a massive infusion of funding for state coffers, and that really the most um, feasible mechanism for that on the horizon right now is the graduated income tax ballot initiative in 2018. So I would add that to the discussion as well. Mm -hmm. Good point. Any other comments about the uh, resolution? Okay, hearing none, all those in favor of, uh, of <coughs> in, uh, endorsing this resolution, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Bisansky, for bringing that forward. Um, next, we have a vote. Uh, this is actually a bid award. Uh, and this relates uh, to the Jackson Street playground structure that we earlier uh, accepted a gift for, and I'll turn it over to Ms. Walzik. Yes, we referenced this earlier in relation to the gift, but this is another phase of the playground project. Um, Central Services went out to bid for the additional equipment. Only one bid was received from Play Ventures in the amount of $61,734. At this point, there is just over $41,000 left in the CPA grant that the PTO had received for the project. We've used the other grant funds up already in the earlier phases, so the balance of the grant money will be used for this bid, and then the check we received tonight from the PTO for approximately $20,000 will fund the rest of this contract. If you award the bid tonight to Play Ventures, then the superintendent can go ahead and sign the contract, and we can move on to 
getting the installation of this scheduled. Make a motion to award the bid. Uh, what was it to play adventures? To play ventures. Play ventures for the Jackson Street playground structure. Second. Okay. Any questions about uh, about this great project? Okay. Um, Hearing no other discussion, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, the uh, bid is, uh, is awarded. The next uh, item is a fourth reading, uh, and this is again um, just to make sure that it comes on our agenda and uh, it's read, the proposal to name the NHS digital marquee uh, in memory of Patricia Samalevich. Uh, there's no vote required this evening under our rules, um, so we'll just uh, note that we have done our fourth reading for the record. Um, next, we move to the <coughs> business administrator's report and uh, turn it back to you, uh, Ms. Walzik. Yes, the first item on the report is the monthly budget appropriation report. Uh, most of the areas that we've indicated have deficits or discussions we've had in the past. Um, the heating season is cooperating with us, so we're hoping between that and a couple of other potential savings with substitute cost and possibly some special ed savings that we will be able to cover these deficits and close out the year fine. we we'll still continue to watch it closely and we'll continue to hope for good weather. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions on the financial report? Secondly, it's just to let you know that the NCTV lease to use the space at the high school is actually expiring in April. And because of the turnover in both NCTV um, and all the city departments that were involved with this lease, nobody was aware that it was coming up. So we have started discussions and we'll be coming back to you in the future about, um, it appears that we are going to have to go out to bid doing an RFP similar to what we did for Biker School. Um, the current lease does have language allowing us to extend up to one year. We're investigating whether we can do that under the financial restrictions of 35000 before you go to bid. So we'll probably be recommending an extension for some period of time to give us time to actually issue that RFP and go out to bid for a new lease. So that is being worked on now by all the related city departments and we'll be back to you hopefully next month for the first vote on moving forward with an RFP. Third item is to let you know if you didn't catch the mayor's announcement that he has forwarded the capital plan to the city council. There were six projects in there for NPS, um, which was nice to see. And then the one that you don't really see, I've included the list for you to, so that you can see what those projects are. But if you look at that, what you don't see is probably the biggest project and one that probably will have the biggest impact on us is the replacement of the phone system for the entire city, of which we are a big portion of that. So the goal is to try and get that done this summer. The project is already moving ahead with a um, consultant who's helping to design that system. So we're hoping that by the time we come back in September, we will have new phone systems in the schools. And then the last item is an update on the gifts that have been received under your policy that are under $1,000. There were no gifts this month from the PTO. I think they choose, chose to do the bigger gifts. Um, and then the, PT, the gifts that came in directly to the superintendent were gifts from Paula Hamill of used books for the library at JFK and also Patricia Young for some books for the library at JFK. And also from Target under their tape take charge of education rewards program there was a donation of three hundred fifty seven hundred three hundred and fifty seven dollars to NHS so it's a small increase to the prior number but it continues to grow um, do you want to move into the personnel report <coughs> yes I just have to find it here. sure are there any other leases we should really know about at this point because I feel like we've been caught up right twice yeah. um, I can mm -hmm. say that well, um, I'm not aware of it. I'm just going to say that it's interesting because the um, the NCTV one is sort of tied to the the Comcast, our city's contract with Comcast, which is a 10-year contract, and so we've been renegotiating that contract, and then we were also renegotiating the MOU between the city and NCTV. So all of these things were done 10 years ago by a whole different set of people. So that's sort of why they've come forward. Um, I'm not aware of any other leases uh, that uh, you'll, I'd have to talk to you, uh, <laughs> talk to our uh, I chief procurement officer about any other leases yeah. that might be out there. I would just like to say in defense, I, the, the uh, Fiker School actually, the, it, we had our first meetings in budget about yeah. a year before it expired, so it was yeah. not 
it just it just feels that way because we didn't get it concluded until just last month. Right. <laughs> but and we met with them but, um, before even budget and property. Right. Uh, we met with them so six someone, months someone actually had was being paid attention to in a timely fashion. I guess I'm caught off guard because I don't go to your meetings. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Um, okay. Uh, okay, we'll move into the superintendent's report then. Dr. Provost. She didn't do the Oh, sorry. Report. Yeah, that was a quick personnel report. <laughs> so quick, I didn't will be a quick it. personnel report. Okay. Um, we had two hires this month of ESPs at Bridge and JFK. Mm -hmm. We had the separation of five coaches, which is normal. This is to document the coaches that were here last year, maybe are coming back, and there's new coaches that have replaced them. Um, separation of a speech and language pathologist. And also, um, regrettably, if everyone is aware, one of our fifth grade teachers at JFK passed away. Um, she had worked for the district for over 10 years, and it's a Jackson. great loss to the district, but Paula Welchman. Jackson. Jackson. Um, Paula Welchman's presence will be missed at Jackson Street School. Okay, um, we'll now move to the superintendent's report. Thank you. In my advisory role to, to this board, I've done my best to draw your attention to potential threats facing the district and recommend the appropriate fiscal and policy responses. Tonight, I need to advise you of a new threat that I can only describe as a crisis of professional identity that your teachers have expressed to me in various ways and have expressed to you this evening. Um, a great deal of my work to support teachers involves helping them process the emotions that arise from state-imposed accountability systems. Those of you on this board who are public school teachers in Massachusetts understand what it's like to have the collective performance of you and your colleagues reported in the paper at both the building and the district level. And if you're in a tested grade and subject, you also know what it's like to receive the state's formula-driven assessment of your impact on students. The only real consolation I have to offer staff is to listen and to say that neither I nor any of the administrators let the state tell us how to evaluate our teachers. And as it's been pointed out to me, this is very cold comfort in the face of the numbers that the state attaches to teachers' EPIMS records as if they were players' batting averages. That is a danger to professional identity. In my opinion, the recent Challenge All Students Facebook posting has exasperated the crisis of teacher professional identity. This has been hard for me to manage, in part because I've not been privy to all the communication on the issue. In the communications I have seen, and in my own conversations with teachers, they have described the episode as leaving them exhausted, demoralized, unappreciated, disheartened, and frustrated. Those are direct quotes. Many of my administrators feel the same way. I think the challenge of these criticisms hits closer to home for our staff, precisely because they're homegrown. This time the judgment is not the output of some state-devised accountability algorithm, it comes from the community, and so it really hurts. I know that everyone on this board has high expectations for the performance of the district, and so do I. My experience is that teachers perform best when they're encouraged to grow and exercise agency within their field of credentialed expertise. That doesn't mean that teachers should not be held accountable to our standards for curriculum and instruction. We've had ve very difficult conversations with some teachers, some in the context of these meetings, but these conversations have always involved the teachers. Um, I sincerely want to help this district reach the high standards that I know each and every one of you has for our kids. I think this will only be possible if the teachers and administrators are performing to their maximum capability. And in order to do that, they really need to be secure in their professional identity knowing that they will not have to fight a rear guard action at the same time as they're trying to implement the curriculum we've designed and differentiate instruction for their students. I know we can do better as a district. I believe the key to that is bringing out the best in teachers and administrators. And I think the way to do that is to help them progress towards goals that they help determine. I'm not an expert in math. I'm a leadership expert. In my professional opinion, the challenge issue has started to diminish leadership in the district, 
by causing individuals to question the basic agreements upon which the leader-follower relationship based, is based. I urge you to resolve this matter quickly in a way that affirms prof teacher professional identity. And that's my report. Okay. Um, we have uh, no new business items on the agenda this evening. Um, we do have future business and meeting dates. The school committee retreat, uh, which is tomorrow night, uh, to 6 p.m. at the Florence Civic Center. We have a budget and property subcommittee meeting on March 17th at 3 p.m. at the superintendent's office. We have the superintendent evaluation team March 17th, 4.30 p.m. at the superintendent's office. We have a negotiating subcommittee training meeting on March 18th. Uh, 6 p.m. at JFK, and then we have a school committee meeting here in the community room at JFK on March 24th, 2016 at 7.15 p.m. I would now entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Is there a second? <laughs> second. Okay. Um, other, uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. The school committee meeting is adjourned.